Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to LawCaseUK.com, where today I'm going to be looking at the 1977 case of the Crown against Turnbull. I'm going to be referring to the case as Turnbull throughout the video cast, but it is, in effect, a conjoined appeal which has within it two other cases, that of Whitby and that of Roberts. I'm also going to be confining myself to the facts as they present themselves in the case of Turnbull, because it's really the principles that the Turnbull case provides that are of greatest interest, and I will use the facts of Turnbull to show an application of those principles, but the other two appeal cases merely provide other examples of how the principles have been applied. Now, in terms of principles, Turnbull remains the leading case in terms of setting out guidelines to be followed in cases of disputed identification and that's what um, I'm talking about today this notion of disputed identification in particular where the dispute involves a witness that might be honest but mistaken. Now before I deal with the case itself what I want to do is set out some basic context to the case and the most important aspect of this is the report of the Committee on Evidence of Identification in Criminal Cases in 1976. Uh, this is a report that of course is better known as the Devlin Report. Now Lord Devlin's committee was established following um, the cases of Virag and Doherty which together raised serious questions as to the law and procedures surrounding identification evidence. Now these cases which the report itself terms as miscarriages of justice both centred around identification evidence from the honest but mistaken witness. And it's this type of evidence that concerned both the Devlin Committee and the Court of Appeal in the case of Turnbull. Now, we begin by recognising that no system can eliminate the dishonest or unreliable witness, but the the Devlin report summarised the particular problem caused by identification evidence in the following way. It said, The value of the evidence is very difficult to assess. The weapon of cross-examination is blunted. The witness says he recognises the man, and that is almost that. There is no story to be dissected, just a simple assertion to be accepted or rejected. If a witness thinks he has a good memory for faces when in fact he has a poor one, there is no way of detecting that. And to this may be added that fact that an honest witness comes across to the jury as sincere as he or she believes what they are saying. And in this regard, Devlin referred to a statement of Lord Gardner made at a similar time in Parliament when he said, sincerity communicates itself to the members of the jury who therefore accept the evidence. Now, the Devlin Committee in its report made some recommendations for statutory enactment, but these were not taken up by the government of the time. But it was against the backdrop of those recommendations that the Court of Appeal considered the Turnbull Appeals and the case is, in effect, a judicial response to the Devlin report. And in fact, although it did not adopt the recommendations verbatim, the Court of Appeals specifically stated that it tried to follow the report's recommendations when it set out its guidelines for trial judges in such cases. So, let me turn to the judgment itself, which was delivered by Lord Widgery. Um, Starting as ever with the facts, the facts are that Turnbull was convicted of conspiracy to commit burglary and this was on the basis of a single identification by an off-duty policeman. At the time of the identification it was night time and the policeman was in a passing car when he caught a glimpse of Turnbull as he momentarily turned his head to face the policeman. It is relevant that Turnbull Turnbull was already known to the policeman involved. Now, in giving the judgment of the court, Lord Widgery began by identifying that visual identification evidence was satisfactory in the majority of cases, 
but that in a small number of cases, miscarriage of justice could come about. And consequently, the purpose of the court's judgment was therefore to provide guidance to judges as to how to direct juries so that the risk of miscarriage can be reduced. Now, in the judgment, Lord Widgery starts with the jury direction, but I would like to start with another aspect of his judgment that came later on, but I think in logical terms it makes sense to deal with it first. Um, and this is an important aspect of the judgment that sometimes is overlooked by students, and this is the aspect where it, which sets out when a judge should or should not allow identification evidence to be left to the jury. And the answer to that question depends upon the quality of the evidence. And as Lord Widgery said, when in the judgment of the trial judge, the quality of the identifi sorry, identifying evidence is poor, as for example, when it depends solely on a fleeting glance or on a longer observation made in difficult conditions, the judge should then withdraw the case from the jury and direct an acquittal, unless there is other evidence which goes to support the correctness of the identification. So the initial question concerning the quality of the evidence is for the judge, and if poor, other supporting evidence will be required before it can be left to the jury. Um, it's also the responsibility of the judge to identify any evidence that he or she judges to be capable of supporting the identification. But that's the case if the identification evidence is poor. If it is good, and the example given is recognition of someone already known, together with a long period of observation, or in satisfactory conditions, by someone knowing the defendant, it can be left to the jury even if unsupported. So if good, it can be left even in unsupported, provided that an adequate warning is given as to the special need for caution. And this is the crux of the judgment in the case, namely the Turnbull warning. But before we look at the warning, I wanted to just deal with that first aspect of the case, which is when the judge should trust the jury with the evidence at all. But providing it's sufficient to be left to the jury, then a warning should be given. And this warning can be broken down into three parts. Um, the first part might be termed the general part of the warning, although Lord Widgery doesn't use that phrase himself. Um, but as for this general warning, I can do no better than read in its entirety from the judgment. And I've got to do quite a bit of that from here on in, but it's important that I do so. So here's the general warning. Warning as to the particular dangers of identification evidence. So I quote, First, whenever the case against an accused depends wholly or substantially on the correctness of one or more identifications of the accused, which the defence alleges to be mistaken, the judge should warn the jury of the special need for caution before convicting the accused in reliance on the correctness of the identification or identifications. In addition, he should instruct them as to the reason for the need for such a warning and should make su some reference to the possibility that a mistaken witness can be a convincing one and that a number of witnesses can all be mistaken. Provided this is done in clear terms, the judge need not use any particular form of word. So that's the general warning. And you can see from that that the court is only concerned in cases where there is a mistaken but honest witness. If the identification is fabricated, of course, there actually is no identification. Um, and the witness is a dishonest witness and um, should be tested by cross-examination in the usual way. But here the court is concerned with a warning on real identifications, but pointing out that an honest witness could be mistaken. Now the second thing that comes up is a specific warning where the judge asks the jury to look at the specific aspects of the identification itself. And here the court recommended as follows. It said, 
Secondly, the judge should direct the jury to examine closely the circumstances in which the identification by each witness came to be made. How long did the witness have the accused under observation? At what distance? In what light? Was the observation impeded in any way? As, for example, by passing traffic or a press of people. Had the witness ever seen the accused before? How often? If only occasionally, had he any special reason for remembering the accused? How long elapsed between the original observation and the subsequent identification to the police? Was there any material discrepancy between the description of the accused given to the police by the witness when first seen by them and his actual appearance? So, specific aspects of the identification to be looked at. In effect, um, a list of pointers there for cross-examination, it, it would appear uh, to be. So, general warning, specific warning. The final aspect to the warning, the third part, if you like, arises only in cases of recognition. And here the court said, recognition, and by recognition I mean an identification made by a witness who already knows the subject, suspect. Going back to the court, they said recognition may be more reliable than identification of a stranger. But even when the witness is purporting to recognise someone whom he knows, the jury should be reminded that mistakes in recognition of close relatives and friends are sometimes made. Now, the court ends its exposition of the guidelines by saying that a failure to follow the guidelines is likely to result in the conviction being quashed if the verdict is unsatisfactory or unsafe. But I'm not sure how helpful that is because of course any conviction will be quashed if it's unsatisfactory or unsafe. The court doesn't go quite as far to say that failure to follow the guidelines will automatically result in a conviction being rendered unsatisfactory or unsafe. Now, having set out the guidelines, the court then directed its attention to applying those guidelines to the facts of the appeals. For the Turnbull case, it was accepted that the identification was itself not good. It was a fleeting glimpse um, and therefore supporting evidence was required. The court looked for supporting evidence and found that in the case the specific identification was supported. It was supported by a description of a coat worn by Turnbull at the time and that description was provided by two witnesses. Also his co-accused was seen driving a van in the vicinity of the crime at the time of the crime and when this van was stopped a few minutes after the sighting Turnbull and his co-accused were found in the van and housebreaking implements were found in the bushes adjacent to the van. Consequently, the court found that the verdict was neither unsatisfactory nor unsafe, and the appeal was dismissed. Thank you.